So thank you so much. Um, yes, so I came down and uh, we've been trying to arrange this for a couple months. And uh, during that time, this work has also been uh, evolving and changing. So this is uh, still we're kind of working on it, but it's nearly done. Um, so it's not a paper that is published yet, but it will be. Uh, hopefully, it will be. <laughs> so uh, this is the first time you'll be seeing this. And um, before I start talking about chain replication, I want to give you a little bit uh, of an idea about myself so you have a little context. So I am about to finish my PhD in distributed systems. I uh, worked on practical stuff, so I implemented a coordination service. I built a framework for you know, building distributed systems automatically, so I know the pains of making things work, uh, debugging and not being able to understand, like, you know, ah, this is not really working. Um, but on the other hand, I also worked on distributed systems theory, and that included uh, understanding protocols, how they work, how we can evolve them, how do we prove that they are correct, they are uh, doing the things that we want them to do. And um, I really enjoyed being able to do both of them. So this work uh, is a little on the theoretical side, but I, uh, of course, uh, will present it in a way that it will make sense to you know, people who are actually interested in understanding how things work. Um, so, um, the chain replication, the original protocol, was invented by Robert Van Rennesse and Fred Schneider, and I was lucky enough to work with them to evolve it and change it. So, the new version uh, I built also, uh, I worked with them, uh, and this was published by 2004. So, after this slide, I had a bunch of uh, slides that are kind of introductory about, you know, replication, why do we need it, but because Wes talked about replication, I just skipped all of them right now, so I'll just dive in. I don't want to waste your time. Uh, but the main idea is we replicate data, so when there's failure, we are fine, we don't lose the data, and then we can you know, keep going, and that's why we have distributed systems and stuff. Um, so the other thing is when we talk about replication, I wanted to give some context, but after trying for a couple slides, I realized replication could be a talk in itself. So I'm not going to go over everything here, but I will focus on uh, the things that I highlighted. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, um, the types of failures that we are able to tolerate are fail-stop failures. What this means is uh, when there's a failure, we assume the server just crashes, doesn't do anything bad. Um, and uh, we also assume that this um, failure is detectable by other servers. I know in reality this doesn't really work this way. That's why when you really implement chain replication, you really need good ways of you know, detecting failures and stuff like that. But for the purposes of this talk and the protocol itself, we just you know, make this assumption. Um, then I will go through uh, only two replication techniques. One is primary backup. I will talk about it a little bit because a lot of people know of chain replication as a specialized version of primary backup. So I think it's important to understand what primary backup is. Uh, then I, of course, we'll talk about chain replication. And I will talk about a bunch of different consistency models because this is one of the cool things about the new protocol. Uh, and as I talk about them, I'll go into detail, so right now I'm not really uh, talking about them yet. Okay, so let's talk about primary backup replication. The main idea behind primary backup replication is we have a client uh, that is talking to, let's assume, a data store. So the client is sending an update, and uh, the servers in this distributed data store are organized in a way that there is one primary which receives the updates, which are the writes, and then uh, sends it back uh, to the backup. So the update is sent to the primary, it backs up um, to the backups, these happen on the, uh, in parallel, and then a reply is sent back to the client. So if the primary crashes, we have three backups in this example, for example, and then we can still go on. Uh, if it, there's a query, uh, the, which is basically a read, uh, the client sends the query to the primary, and then the primary has to make sure that every update is you know, done, all the acknowledgements are received from the backups, and then can send the reply back to the client. 
Um, so in chain replication, we organize the servers or the data stores a little bit differently, and that's where the name comes from. So they, comes from. They are organized in a chain. So we have the head of a chain which receives the updates. So the client sends an update. It's received by the head. And then the head sends it to the second replica. The second replica sends it to the third replica. The third replica sends it to the tail. And then the tail sends a reply back to the client. So um, in this chain uh, organization, the client uh, update is replicated on all of the replicas. Um, and the query only goes to the tail, so client always reads from the tail. So one of the reasons that chain replication is different is because uh, the query goes to the replica, uh, the tail, and then uh, it, the, uh, it doesn't have to check with the others. So the main chain replication looks like this. This will be the image that you would see in uh, the papers and uh, stuff like that. And um, so I want to show something here. Uh, here in primary backup, the latency is, uh, which is the number of messages that you have to send to receive a reply, is uh, one for the update, two, three for the backups, and then four that is coming back to the client. Uh, in chain replication, on the other hand, is if you have, for example, four uh, replicas, the latency is higher. So in chain replication, the latency is actually higher, which is bad, we don't really want that. But because um, we are uh, in the primary backup sending queries to the primary, which has to check that all acknowledgments are drained and then sends a reply back to the client. And in uh, chain replication, we do not have to do that. So um, in chain replication, tail can respond automatically and we get a better, higher throughput. Does that make sense? Oh, also you can ask questions if you want um, during the talk. So uh, we are dividing the, uh, the labor between the head and the tail, and then we are also querying the tail only, which doesn't really have to check anything. Uh, I think you want, to, yeah. Yes, so he asked queries are happening while updates are happening at the same time, which is correct. So you do not really have this bottleneck of primary doing updates and queries at the same time. So you can divide the work and the tail can process queries while the head can, is processing um, updates. Okay, so um, from this we get higher throughput. And that's the main idea behind chain replication and in what, why it was you know, a better protocol than primary backup. Yes? Yes, so he uh, is asking what are the opposite arrows that are going from the tail to the head. Um, those are the acknowledgments sent back from the tail, so uh, that says that the update is done. So I didn't go into details yet, I will uh, shortly, yes. Okay. Um, so throughout the years, there has been a lot of work uh, about chain replication. Uh, please notice the uh, uh, ellipsis here, so there's much more work about chain replication. And this includes papers that um, use the protocol to build systems. Um, and this also includes papers that worked on the protocol to make it better. This includes papers that uh, make it, for example, chain replication made practical, things like that. Um, so what we wanted to do, uh, this was like about a year ago, is um, Robert and Fred wanted to look at all these papers, uh, wanted me to look at all these papers, and then understand you know, if we can make a survey and then see what people did with chain replication and if there is something that you know, we can combine it into a survey paper that would be good. Um, so I read all these papers uh, and more, and then uh, we realized that in some papers, uh, some of the um, uh, improvements, especially done on chain replication, were not really obvious, and they were not really detailed in those papers. So, uh, and we uh, started work, like meeting and discussing why this works this way, why this works that way, why would you build a system that uses, you know, this many chains in this way, and things like that. And then, over time, we realized uh, that I do not have presentation yet anymore. Okay, so over time, we realized that, you know, uh, maybe we can actually um, make it a more, um, you know, theoretical paper and then actually describe or explain why things work the way they work. Like how uh, are these improvements that people did on chair replication work. So uh, some of the limitations people um, noticed and improved upon 
are that the tail is a bottleneck for queries. So even if it was an improvement for us to move the queries to the tail uh, of, on you know, primary backup, we still have all these nodes that have at least part of the state that we uh, are updating. And we are not really utilizing any of that. So that, we, there should be some way of you know, utilizing the nodes in between and then um, having queries that are read from different uh, nodes. The second thing is uh, chain replication supports, or the original version gives strong consistency or linearizability. Um, and uh, there is a way, you know, we kind of make a trade-off between the consistency, uh, how much of it we want, and then the performance we get. Uh, so some papers, uh, for example, Crack and Chain Reaction, supported different kinds of uh, consistency models, like sequential consistency, uh, uh, eventual consistency, causal consistency, that uh, you could read from different nodes, and now you wouldn't necessarily get a total order of updates, but you would get some kind of a state, and maybe it's good for you, so, you know, who are we to judge? And the third one is uh, about reconfiguration. So in a lot of papers, um, reconfiguration is kind of like swept under the rug, uh, because it's kind of not really uh, easy to do it in chain replication. You need a master, you need a good uh, failure detector. So we wanted to kind of get rid of that necessity of at least having the master, so the nodes themselves can reconfigure the chain. So today I'm basically going to be talking about this. Um, and the motivation uh, is basically we want to explain why the improvements suggested by other people work. Uh, we want to find further improvements, if possible, uh, one of them being making reconfiguration easier and cleaner. And uh, two more is creating a complete uh, specification of the client, the server that is replicated with chain replication and stuff. By specification, I mean we model the state and all the state transfers and how things change. Um, and then we prove using these specifications that you know it works. But during this talk, so the reason the two last two bullets are separated here is they are not in this talk because that's more theoretical and that's boring. Uh, for a talk, so uh, but I will show it with images, and uh, so I'll give you the idea, uh, which I think is the cooler part anyway. Um, so the talk uh, is uh, outlined this way. So we have I'm going to talk about updates, then queries, uh, then I'm going to talk about failures, reconfiguration, and in the end, uh, various consistent mod sub models and how they are supported. Okay, so from this point on, I have a lot of images and pictures, which is Cool. Okay. So let's start with updates. Um, as I said, uh, we have a chain. So we have multiple nodes. Uh, let's uh, assume we have four. Uh, from this point on, uh, I want to always talk about nodes uh, having two histories. So a node has a speculative history, which has uh, which is a history which is speculative, which is which is not uh, committed yet, but it includes the updates that will be in the history at some point. So that's the main idea. And now we have a stable history for every node, which is stabilized or uh, committed history. Um, so I will also talk about uh, nodes, and uh, one uh, wording we use is predecessor and successor. So in here, for example, R2 comes before R3 on the chain. Uh, so R2 is the predecessor of R3. And uh, again, here R3 comes after R2, so R3 is R2's successor. Okay, so let's assume we're at a point in time that our uh, service has two updates in its history. Uh, so we have a black update and a burgundy update, uh, and everything is committed. So every node has the same uh, speculative and stable histories. So we get a green update from a client, uh, and then this update is received by the head. The head adds it to its speculative history, then sends a message. We call this a propagation message. So the, uh, these updates are propagated down the chain, basically. Uh, and then this propagation message is received by the successor of the head, and then um, it, that uh, node adds it to its speculative history, sends a propagation message, and then we keep going this way until we reach the tail. So the tail adds it to its speculative history and realizes 
realizes that, oh, okay, I'm the tail, I do not have a successor, so I will just flush my speculative history to be my stable history. This is the moment that we say, okay, this update is now stabilized, so it's committed. And this is also when the reply is sent back uh, to the client, and the reply includes the stable history of the tail. So then uh, we have acknowledgments uh, going down the chain the other way. So the tail sends an acknowledgment message. Uh, the predecessor of the tail adds it to its stable history. This way every node uh, stabilizes the update in their history. And now we arrive at the head. So uh, this is how an update is done. Uh, if we had them one at a time. But in reality, it kind of looks more like this because we have multiple updates happening at the same time. So we have a green update, a blue update, a purple update. Histories have different lengths. So, um, and when you look at a, a chain replicated system, it's not really easy to understand, you know, how you can read from different nodes, for example. For example, if I wanted to decide to read from R2, what kind of consistency does that give me if another client reads from R R3? So, uh, but there is something uh, cool here, which is um, we kind of can see where the messages or the updates are in a pipeline. So we know that, for example, green made it to R3 stable history, blue made it to the tail, we know that the purple made it to the second uh, replica. And from uh, this kind of ordering, we could actually see that there is some type of organization between these histories. So for example, all the speculative histories, the largest one is on the head, and then the smallest one is on the tail. And for stable histories, the uh, converse is true. And for every node, uh, the speculative history is always greater than the stable history. So we can get kind of a, you know, an ordering or for understanding of how these histories are uh, ordered. So for example, we, so this gives us basically three rules, which is the speculative history of a node successor is always a subset of uh, that node's speculative history because it comes after it, which makes sense. Propagation happens from left to right. Um, for uh, in a node, the speculative history uh, is always a superset of the stable history, which makes sense because for uh, uh, update to be stabilized, it has to go through the chain, uh, whole chain. And then lastly, for the stable histories, we know we, or we can see that the stable history of a node successor is a superset of uh, that node's stable history. Okay, so this makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, this is where I start talking about queries now. So uh, we understand how updates work, how histories are ordered. So when it comes to queries, let's start from the more chaotic uh, situation of like we have the blue, purple, green, all these updates there in the pipeline. And then the queries are always sent to the tail. Uh, and then the tail always replies with its stable history. Because we have only one node that is always replying to queries, we have a point of linearization, basically. And that is the thing that gives us linearizability. So if we have multiple updates, we are sending replies for those updates. And then at the same time, we might be sending replies for queries. But you would see, and also because of the way we updated the histories and we know how they're updated, it's easy to see that all the query uh, replies are always consistent or they are totally ordered with the updates, um, update replies that are happening. That's because we always answer with the stable history of the tail. So that's perfectly uh, reasonable. Um, and uh, as I said, the tail is a point of linearization. That's why we get strong consistency or linearizability. Okay, that's the, that was the queries. Uh, that was not really that complicated, so let's talk about failures now. Um, the main idea behind failures is when, uh, so the main, about, the main thing about replication is we replicate so we can uh, tolerate failures. And um, these happen, uh, uh, this can happen at any time, and then the head can fail, a middle node can fail, or the tail can uh, node can fail. And uh, in all of these cases, we kind of have to adjust in different ways. So uh, when the head uh, node fails, we can just get it out of the uh, configuration, and then nothing really has to change because we still have that ordering of speculative and stable histories, and the second node just becomes automatically the head, and we're still fine. Um, 
the trickier part is if uh, a client had sent, let's say, an orange update to the head and the head added it to its speculative history, it might just fail before it can send a propagation message to the next uh, node. In this case, that update gets lost, but that's fine because the client never received a reply about the fact that that update has been added to any history or anything like that. So if we implemented our client uh, properly using the end-to-end -end argument, <laughs> so then we, the client would have to send it again and then we try. Um, if a middle node fails, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. So now we have to make sure that the predecessor of the node that failed starts talking to the successor of the node and the successor uh, starts talking to the predecessor. Um, at that moment, the predecessor sends all the updates that have been uh, in the pipeline. So uh, note that the R3 here does not have the purple update, for example. It will receive it from the head and it add it to its speculative history. So we fixed uh, the, you know, uh, the discrepancy that happens between speculative histories. Similarly, R3 has the green update and R head does not have it, but R3 will send an acknowledgement and R head would get it, yes. So if the head notices that R2 has failed, does it then immediately resend directly to R3 anything that it was sending to R2 but hadn't yet been responded? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So there are some things that I'm kind of glossing over, uh, which is, for example, uh, how do we detect failures and stuff. But as I said in the beginning, this is fail stuff, so I just assume everybody knows the configuration. Yes, you had a question. So I you update. So uh, what part? How do I differentiate between updates? Oh, every update has a client ID and operation and stuff like that. So I here just have colors, of course, but every update is ID, yes. Um, yeah. Is there a reason I see. So the question is, is there a reason if I have four? No, I have four because they look good on the slide. Um, and uh, this, there's... Uh, no, so the only thing is chain replication is able to tolerate F plus one failure. So here my um, F is three. Uh, sorry, it, it needs F plus one replicas to tolerate F failures. So here it can tolerate three failures and then you would still have one node that has all the states. So that's the only thing, yeah, yeah. So why wouldn't you add another node Perfect. to maintain the link? Yes, so the question is why would I not add a node? I will, <laughs> I should, because over time, you know, if things keep failing, at some point my f would be zero because f plus one will be one. Uh, so that's the next section, which is we will add things, okay. Okay, so uh, we fixed the middle node failure uh, because we were able to send messages and I fixed the histories and kept the ordering between them. Uh, so the tail failure is uh, another uh, issue. So we have a tail, it fails. Now the uh, predecessor of the tail will be the new tail. So uh, one thing that was very important about the tail is tail had the speculative history and the stable history always equal to each other. Uh, and uh, now it's not the case. So the moment this, the uh, node here realizes that, oh, I'm the head, I'm the tail, it will just flush its speculative history to be its stable history and we do not lose any updates this way. So uh, just notice that blue then became stable uh, automatically. This could be that, for example, if there was a uh, delay between the R3 and R tail before, it could be that we would flush four or five updates at the same time. So, uh, but we are still safe in terms of you know, consistency and it doesn't really um, break, okay? Um, so the next part is reconfiguration, which is, okay, we are able to tolerate failures, but if we just let everything fail over time, we will be left with zero nodes. So we, at some point we have to add nodes. Um, and uh, the way we would want to add nodes is we would introduce a new tail. 
Um, this uh, node in the beginning would of course be empty in terms of the speculative history and stable history. Um, in the original chain replication uh, protocol, we had a master which would bring up the uh, new tail, tell all the nodes, okay, there is this new tail. After this operation, it's the new tail. So it would coordinate everything and then update uh, the whole configuration. Uh, in this version, we got rid of the master and then we are uh, doing the configuration using special um, configuration updates. So we have a, a special configuration updates. Here I call it ed, and then it comes with a node ID. Uh, one thing I want to note here is uh, imagine chain just with one node in the beginning. So every node is basically added to the chain using this add command. And the order they are added, uh, which means the order the updates are added to the history, would give the nodes the configuration because everything is ordered. Here I can literally look at the picture and say, okay, our head was the first replica when I started chain replication. R2 was added afterwards, after three, R3 was added afterwards and things like that. So there's an order of how we add them in the configuration. So um, we add them uh, with an update. So I'll fast forward uh, here. By looking at the order of updates, we can say what the configuration is. So I'll fast forward a little bit. So we have this uh, add uh, operation, which is green and uh, red at the same time. It arrives at the tail. So the tail sees this new special configuration command and realizes, oh, I'm not the tail anymore, so there's gonna be a new guy. Um, and uh, it has to make sure that this is the point that it acknowledges there is gonna be a new tail. So there are some things that we have to make sure. First, we have to make sure that when the new tail comes up, the stable history of this new tail is a superset of the old tail. Right now it's empty, so this doesn't really hold. Uh, the second thing we have to hold, we need to hold, is that the speculative history of that tail is a superset of its stable history. And then the third thing is that we need the speculative history of uh, the recent tail to be a superset of the new tail. This already holds, but once we update things, we still have to make sure that this happens. The easiest way to make sure that this is the case is having the first uh, two uh, things equal to each other. So if we are able to flush the speculative history of uh, our tail to our new tail, uh, they become equal, which is a superset operation uh, or superset equal operation. Then the speculative history, we flush it to the stable history. Uh, they become equal to each other and automatically the stable history will then be uh, equal or a superset of the stable history of the tail. So this way, we do not need a master. We don't need anything. Every node knows what to do. Does that make sense? Perfect. So let's do that. Um, so the tail sends all of its history. Of course, in reality, you wouldn't really send everything. You would have some type of garbage collection checkpointing and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but you send all of the updates. The new tail flushes everything to its speculative history, then copies it to, its, to be its stable history, and we're all good. So the stable history is now a superset of the stable history of the tail. Yes. Yes, good question. So uh, the question is why, while this is happening, who's answering queries? Um, the, 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 actually that's, yeah, here I was gonna say. So anything that happens before that configuration, the old tail replies. And uh, anything that happens after that green and blue, including the green and blue, the new tail uh, replies. And that's a very clean cutoff and that's very important. And because of this, if you really implement this, the other thing you would do is you would have the new tail somewhere in the background running, collecting all of the state without sending the configuration message. So it would have a majority or like most of the updates that are already in the history. The moment it receives the configuration message, it would be maybe the second or the third message it receives, and then that point on it would just start answering to query, so we don't really lag. Yeah. Yes. So does the cutover happen when the speculative history, when, when R new passes the new tail message back to it as an acknowledgement? Then you know that you've done them all. Yes. Yeah, so the question is uh, the the cutoff happens when uh, the 
configuration message acknowledgement is sent. It's when the configuration message is basically flushed to the stable history. Uh, so then, because we have to reply with the stable history, that's when we uh, start the new tail, like answering questions. Yes. Uh, so for queries, yes, not the updates. The updates always go to the hail, but it will start. So there's no point because it seems like. Um, so the updates always go to the tail, uh, to the head, and then they go down the chain, and then our tail, at some point after the green, would, so when it sees the green, it stops flushing it to its stable history, it starts sending it to the new tail. And then it, at the same moment, it also starts rejecting queries because it's not the tail anymore. And queries are just read operations. But could there be like a new update in the pipeline uh, from another? Yeah, the question is, couldn't there be another update? Yes, there could be. And that would be added after the red-green dot here. And then it would add it to its speculative history. And then it would send a propagation message. So then it just becomes a middle node. So it always accepts them, but it doesn't flush them to tail until switch over. Yes, of course, yes. Right. Yeah. OK. Uh, and then we send the acknowledgments. Of course, in reality, we don't send everything. We do some stuff in the background. But then uh, the RTL gets the uh, configuration message, which is now stabilized, and everything goes uh, from there. Yes. Client servers. I see. Uh, not really. So what we so kind of like if you if then we implement this, it would be like you would go to. So there's a proxy that the you know clients talk to, and the proxy knows where the head and the tail is and things like that. So the proxy is responsible for knowing where to send the query. So, so there is actually like a, like a connection, like yes, there is a connection and stuff like that. So the proxy would actually you know maybe through DNS or something, would realize, oh, OK, now the tail changed, so this is where I update the queries. If you want, you could, for example, have the old tail just be like, OK, you know, I'll just forward the query to the new tail. There are different kinds of you know, implementing the behavior. OK, yeah. Three. So when the tail fails, let's say R3 takes over, you just commit everything that's in the speculative history immediately. So what's the point of the stable history in terms of Yeah. Okay. So the question is: so if our so this would be in the previous section, our tail just fails, and then R three commits everything automatically to its stable history. And what so in terms of consistency, what is the point of stable history? I will actually talk about it in the next uh, you know part. But I want to kind of make it obvious that the stable history is when we know that you know we can tolerate failures. So. Um, uh, maybe I'll talk about it with slides and stuff. It's easier. Yeah. The question is, why does the head need to know what the stable history is? My guess is it's for like block truncation. Can you say it again? I couldn't hear. Like, why does the head care what the stable history is? The head? Yeah. The head doesn't because the head is only responsibility is just ordering things like sending updates to the tail. The 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 reason we have a stable history is basically being able to answer to queries queries in a uh, strongly consistent manner. Or I guess, why does it get communicated back up? Uh, it gets communicated back up because that, that's when all nodes know that, OK, every, so this made it to the tail, so the client actually received that response. But you don't actually care if the tail fails. Because if, if all the other, if all the other nodes fail, Yes, so maybe that's a good way of thinking about it. When you flush things, you just have to send replies and let the client know we actually did these things. Yeah. Yes.
I see. So the question is, how do you know the data is transferred between nodes reliably? Uh, we just assume <laughs> it is a reliable connection. No, I mean, in reality, you would, uh, so uh, what I don't really show here is messages have like uh, client IDs, operations, and things like that. And then um, I guess you kind of assume there is a, a reliability in like, for example, TCP and things like that. So um, uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, OK. OK. So let's talk about different consistency models because this was uh, one of the more interesting uh, things in other papers. Um, so uh, let's start with strong consistency, which is what I've been talking about, but I will talk about it in more detail. So the main idea behind strong consistency is if an update completes, any query or any read that happens after it would have to return that update. So, or the better way of saying it is the history that is sent back to the client as a result of query has to include that update. Uh, and this gives us a total order. So as we said, uh, this is easy when we can just read from the tail. So the tail can just reply to queries and then tail is the point of basically making sure that everything is you know, totally ordered. Another way of doing that is, is any node can uh, so receive a query and then the moment it receives a query, it looks at its speculative history. It's, for example, in this example, R3 receives a query and says, okay, the last update I have in my speculative history is blue. So I'm gonna delay this query message until my uh, blue update is stabilized. And now when it's stabilized, then uh, it's necessarily the case that it's already been stabilized at the tail. And because of that, this node can now send a message and that would also be strongly consistent. Does that make sense? And this follows, or we can kind of like really clearly see this now because of the way the histories are ordered. So we know that if blue made it to the stable history of R3, it definitely made it to the stable history of the tail. And another, um, so we sound reply. And the, another way uh, of looking at it is, uh, actually I use the wording anchor node. So if a node has its speculative history equal to its stable history, then it can just reply. And the reason uh, this uh, holds is because if they are equal to each other, it means any uh, history, speculative or stable, to the right of it until the tail are all equal to each other. And this all also follows from our ordering of histories. Um, so this is the clean versus dirty nodes that was introduced in Crack. Uh, there, the main idea is if you have outstanding updates or something like that, you would call it a dirty node, which means your speculative history is bigger than your uh, stable history, so you cannot really uh, answer. Um, another thing they did in Crack is uh, if, uh, if a node receives a... a Query when it's dirty, it would forward the query to the tail. But instead of forwarding, we introduced the second one, which is just wait a little bit until it's stabilized. Yes. Okay. Um, so the second uh, consistent model, model we can support is sequential consistency. Yes. Um, you could load balance, so the question is if you wait for the uh, nodes to be clean, is that a way of load balancing? Yes, because then you can support reads from all of the nodes, but I want to kind of underline something. We are not really waiting for nodes to be clean because the main idea we wanted to introduce the second one is a node may never be clean because things are just happening, like there are a bunch of updates. And then as we saw in that pipeline with the purple and the, all the you know, uh, updates, you can't really really expect a node to you know, sit still and wait for everything to be stabilized. Uh, here, you just take a snapshot of the speculative history and then just send a reply back when stable history is equal to it. It might have been at that moment the case that the speculative history is now longer, but you don't care because you, know, you take, took a snapshot there and now you're sending it. Okay. Um, so sequential consistency, the main idea behind sequential consistency is we want to preserve an ordering between updates, uh, but we can return an old history. Uh, as long as you do not reorder updates in history, 
uh, clients are fine with just you know receiving a state that was maybe true five minutes ago. Five minutes is a little bit too big, but uh, you know you can send old histories. Uh, and uh, here, this is easy to uh, do for us because we know that the stable history is always a prefix of. Uh, the stable history of a tail on any node. So if any node receives a query, it can just reply from its stable history, and this would automatically give sequential consistency uh, because nothing is reordered. It, it just may be old. Um, and the third, yes? Can you go back to the You definitely talked about the proxy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the. Yeah. Okay. So I'll talk about monotonicity in a couple of slides. But uh, the question is like, how is the client model? I I actually would like to answer it. So uh, the clients are basically their proxies. They have a uh, in mock update. Uh, look at you know do the update or that receive the reply and then re return it back to the main application part. So it's like in mock do like have it done on the replicas and then completed. So the proxy is responsible for invoking and completing an or update and a query. Okay, yeah. So the proxy is, is decided with this the client A is going to talk to R3. Yes. It's always going to talk to R3. Here for it, it doesn't have to because this is just sequential consistency. But if on top of sequential consistency you also wanted monotonicity, then you would do that. So I'll come to that. But sequential consistency is you can uh, return histories, you know, future back, or it doesn't matter. So the proxy could actually essentially switch if you just want to support sequential consistency. Yes. Um, okay. Is that a question? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is if it reads, it's a client reads from R3 first and now from R2, it's uh, that's violating, for example, strong consistency, but it's not violating sequential consistency. Because in sequential consistency, the only thing we care about is that the uh, updates are not reordered, but it could be missing. Right. Oh, queries, yeah, the queries, yeah. We, we don't even put the queries in history because they're just reads, so they don't change state. Um, so eventual consistency is basically we do an update and eventually that update will be in the history that the client receives. So that's the main idea. And um, the idea here is any node can reply with its speculative history uh, because uh, even if we reply with something that is in uh, the speculative history of, for example, R2, but it's not in RT, eventually it will be in the speculative history of the tail, so it's fine. So if you have a client that just accepts um, you know, sequential eventual consistency, now you're fine. Um, this was uh, used in Crack, crack uh, and um, uh, the, they were replying, they were basically uh, underlining the fact that if you just want uh, eventual consistency, you can read anywhere. And uh, here you can see why that actually is true. Um, so then we have causal consistency. Uh, this was introduced in chain reaction. The main idea is, is we have two different clients, and then they have uh, operations that causally depend on each other. Uh, so uh, then we have to do a reordering of uh, you know how things are read. So uh, this actually requires you to model communication between clients. So it's not really a chain replication. Um, uh, thing that you could really implement in the protocol as opposed to you know just uh, replying from stable or speculative histories but it's a rule that you can implement on the proxy of the uh, client and the main idea is if a client proxy reads from R3 any read it would do would have to be done from the left of R3 because uh, the main idea is anything that comes after for example the blue here would be in R2 and R head, but you cannot go back in time and then read other things because your operations depend on blue. So that's the main idea. 
Uh, so this was in chain reaction. Uh, there is nothing to really prove about this in chain replication, but I wanted to show it because um, for completeness. Um, so for example, here we can send query one, and then query two would have to go to R2. Okay, so read your writes consistency. Again, this is implemented on the client side. The main idea is uh, if an update uh, is done, any, up, any read after that would have to include that update from it. So this is just a single client. So uh, this, uh, again, requires modeling the client side. So on the client proxy, you have to make sure that any history that is returned uh, is a superset of uh, the up, like the history that included the update that same client sent. Uh, so the proxy then would have to keep track of the updates that are in marked and completed and would not return to the client uh, as long as uh, all the in marked uh, updates are not in it. Uh, but apart from that, you can read from anywhere. So a client can just read from any uh, replica. And the monotonic consistency, monotonic read consistency is there is an ordering of you know, uh, reads. If a client has issued a query and received a history as a result, any uh, read would have to send back a history that is either the same or greater. Um, and uh, another way of talking about this is if a client has seen a particular update, uh, any subsequent query would have to have uh, that uh, state that includes the update. Um, so here, uh, we only query one replica all the time. We can get monotonicity because the, we know that the uh, histories of the, that node monotonically changes. Uh, this is the way it's done in Crack. Um, or you can model it on the client side and then make sure that uh, the proxy keeps track of completed updates and then only returns uh, a query reply when uh, all of the uh, complete updates are done. So the uh, history that is returned is a suffix. So this is the part a little uh, more theoretical, I guess, but um, I'm short on time now, so I wanted to kind of skip. Um, okay, so um, before I conclude, uh, I want to show you the backstage of this work. Um, what we try to do is we have chain replication and with strong consistency we want to make it look like it's one thing, right? It's centralized. So what we do in actually the paper is we write the specifications or the state and state transitions for a central uh, client and a server system uh, which uh, kind of looks like this. Um, then we also write the specification for chain replication which looks like this. And then for every uh, transition here, we show that whenever state changes, they map to each other or they uh, change in a way that uh, they do not violate correctness and things like that. Uh, and in, during this presentation, every uh, arrow I showed or any uh, you know, updates, circle, I added to a history or something. Those were all transitions, basically, because I changed states. So basically, I picturized all of it, uh, but that's what the paper is and, you know, how we prove that chain replication or the new version of it works. So uh, the conclusion is we have created uh, a new and um, better kind of chain replication, and we also created a formal end-to-end -end specification, we say, which is what I showed. Um, and through this specification, we can reason about uh, it really easily. Uh, it's very similar to kind of code, so you can actually code it very simply too. Uh, and now you can, as we just all you know, talked about it, you can reason about why things happen the way they do, but how can you support different consistency models and stuff like that easier. Um, so this makes the chain replication hopefully a little bit easier and um, to understand and implement. And we hopefully solved uh, the reconfiguration problem. And then we can also support different consistency models. And there's some stuff to do. So if you want to help, <laughs> uh, please do. So one is I'm 
creating some open source implementations. Uh, Java and Python are happening now. If you want to help, uh, ping me. Uh, those all will be on GitHub at some point. Uh, and I want to create the chain replication Wikipedia page. I still didn't have time to do that, but the, it's not on Wikipedia, so it would be nice to create it. Uh, if you want to help with that, uh, ping me. And my website email is here. I'm also on GitHub. This, the chain replication code is not there yet, but it will be at some point. Yes, so if you have any questions, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, on a failure model, because uh, you only talk about if you fail in the head or fail in the tail or fail in the middle. What if like you fail on two nodes? Oh, um, if you fail at two nodes at the same time, you would handle one at a time, kind of, I think. So um, if two nodes fail at the same time, I don't think it's too complicated. So if they are both middles, the head would, like for example, if you have four again, the head would just start talking to the tail and the tail will talk to the head. If one of them is a tail, then it would have to do the tail stuff first, which is flushing its speculative history and then sending the messages. And if it's the head and another node, uh, then uh, at the tail, we did, we had we didn't really do anything anyway, so then you would just have to, you know, send messages that were not sent to the predecessor and successor. I don't think it should like it. I think it just follows. Yeah, I didn't show them, but I think it just follows because we have this ordering of histories now. Uh, it's it, you just make sure that it holds, and then everything is just fine. Yeah. So I know you talked just about uh, fail stop, right? Sure. So say you lose data in between. In practice, how hard is it to recover it? Or just like add a new tail node? Um, uh, can you, I couldn't hear one part of it. Like, did you ask about the tail failing? Or? Yeah, so if, if you have like an in-between node that failed and you actually lost data, right? It didn't actually behave like a proper fail stop and recovered correctly, what happens? Um, I think you can do some uh, backdoor stuff, which is, for example, you know that the nodes that come before you might have some updates that you don't, so you might try to recover that way. Uh, we, we, of course, didn't put any of that in the specification or prove it, but that's what I would do. Like, I would try to, you know, go back in time, uh, future, to go to the future and then try to understand, you know, if the nodes that come before me have it. But as I so showed, if you fa lose data at the head and stuff, that's just kind of gone. But as long as everything is stabilized and that's when the client hears back from you anyway, you should be fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I hope that last question wasn't the same as mine because I didn't really hear it. <laughs> but, uh, but you mentioned that uh, during updates, the, um, the tail actually responds to the client before committing its speculative history to stable history? No. It's, or is that not the it, case? It flushes its stable history, uh, its speculative history to be stable first, and then answers with the stable history in the reply. So the order is um, basically hand in the code. So <laughs> actually, I didn't want to really show it. But here, for example, there's a handle propagate. So it handles propagate. And then it sends a reply, and then it sends the acknowledgement. So it has like, you know, flush, reply, send an acknowledgement. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Hi. So as, as you're describing sort of the role of the proxy, uh, it sort of strikes me that it's taking on a lot of the um, activities that you would see from a primary and a primary backup system in terms of keeping track of the responses and knowing when and to send responses when to, in, to give you different uh, models. So I'm sort of curious, um, given that becoming part of the system, what you see as sort of the benefits of uh, sequential replication versus parallel, the one that occurs to me is maybe it's just easier to reason about, but I was curious sort of what, you, what your thoughts are when you consider the proxy as part of the entire system rather than being sort of outside the system. Yeah, um, I actually consider it outside of the system proxy because it's not, you know, part of your failure model or anything like that. So you assume there's a proxy per client. So that's, uh, you don't really have to make sure that the proxy is up all the time because that's, you know, collocated with the client. But apart from it, the only things that we kind of push to the client are, uh, 
uh, for example, monotonicity and um, read, like read your rights and causality. And those are, um, I think, uh, we had to do it that way because those are client dependent. Because you, for example, when it comes to causality or causal consistency, you have to know what the client did. And chain replication or the service that is replicated with chain replication cannot possibly know which client talked to which one. And then so there should be an ordering between client A, B, and C's updates, for example. Do you know, uh, does that make sense? So that's why we kind of, I, in my head, it's kind of organic that these are on the client side because those are, you know, things related to the client's behavior. Um, so in terms of especially causality. So, uh, but if you think about monotonicity, uh, you're right. So, uh, and uh, in primary backup, because you are limiting it always onto one node, which was the original chain replication too, um, you you would get monotonicity by you know limiting the rights or the reads of the client to the tail or the primary, because we want to kind of open up the possibility of reading from different uh, nodes. Now we say, okay, client you should decide where you read from though. Like you can read wherever, but if you want monotonicity, you better read from this. So, so it's kind of like a trade-off. Uh, we can implement it on chain replication by limiting it to one node or like the tail. Or we can say you can read it, but you some, now you share some of the responsibility. So you have an ordering on the, on the various nodes and that gives you a way of reasoning about which nodes to talk to to get different exactly. guarantees. Exactly, okay. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll say to that one thing, which is uh, working on a database myself, you, we have the, we call the, the client perspective action at a distance, which is like you don't know, like a client could be gone for a long time and then pass a context of what they think consistency might look like, but that could have been like years ago. We call it the coma problem, right? It could be a coma. So it's an issue where we're having the model they have where where they can choose the consistency is a better version for the client than what the, what the client actually knows, right? So it's a similar idea to that. Anyone else? Uh, questions? Oh, yeah. So in practice, is adding a tail node very expensive? Uh, can you say that? In, in practice, is adding a tail node very expensive? Uh, just reading from the tail node? Just adding a tail adding node. Adding a tail node? Not really, because you could actually do a lot of things in, in the backup. So like some things I glossed over is, for example, we have nodes that might just not be part of the chain. And then the moment they're added to the chain with that add command, we call them chain nodes. And then that point on, they are part of our you know, proofs and stuff like that. But like you can have a node nearly like a tail and then have like two things added to it. It's kind of pricey in terms of uh, depending on how you checkpoint it and stuff like that. So if you really need to um, forward all of the history, uh, that would be pricey, but then if you implement it a little better, you would have some, you know, checkpoint that you would just like, like you're like nearly a tail now. Okay. So yeah. Gotcha. Anyone else? Any questions? Oh, you got another one. Yeah. Just to clarify that, so it's like having a tail plus one. Yeah. And it's just not answering any of the queries, but it's exactly. still, so it's it's still like participating. Exactly. So it's just like there, like happening. Uh, you could also even do something like, oh, I'm going to be a new tail, and you're the tail right now. Why don't you start forwarding things to me at the background? And that tail would be okay. So like, like, but it would not be part of the configuration. We wouldn't reason, like, try to include it in our way of like thinking about speculative stable histories and da da da. But like, it's nearly happening in the background. Yeah. So one question I had. Sure. Uh, with the end and specification that you guys have, uh, is there any, um, uh, uh, so that's, that's what that is actually right there. So this is the chain one, this is yeah. the non-chain one, yeah. And that's like a provable model, something that works like a TLA plus kind of specification or something so, to disagree? Uh, in the paper, we don't, we, I didn't use TLA plus, we just like math, we proved like bunch of Nothing theorems and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's like pages, pages, pages of theorems. Of course, yeah. Of, uh, stuff. Cool. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, Leaf? Yeah. Um, what, uh, where is 
chain replication used in any products if it is? Yes, so uh, there are a lot of key value type of uh, stores that use this. So for example, um, I think Dali Malik is gonna be the keynote speaker for the conference. So in her Corfu and Tango work, which is right now being uh, used in VMware, they use chain replication. In uh, Basho, they had Machi, which was using chain replication, uh, but Scott left, so it's The, not the code there. is still open source. <laughs> the Machi source? code is open source, which is really great. And, and yes, Dalia Maki will be talking yeah, about uh, in, some of that in her uh, talk. In Azure, they use it, uh, and uh, Microsoft Azure, and uh, there is a key value store uh, also from Cornell called Hyperdex, they use it. And also when people use chains, I didn't even talk about any of that here because it's like another way. The really cool way of using chains is having a bunch of chains uh, ordered in a ring and then using like consistent hashing and stuff like that. Uh, so there are a lot of papers who look at those. Uh, I didn't even just, yeah. And, uh, Wes actually, right? Uh, Chartbeat, they use chain replication. Yeah. Uh, we use it at Chartbeat uh, in, in, a, in a system that's in alpha right now, and we publish the, uh, the framework for chain replication. Um, it's in Python, and it's called Wade. Code is available, right? The code is available, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's on GitHub and, and in PyPy as well, so yeah. Yeah, cool. So that's, that's pretty cool, yeah. So there are papers about um, real-world implementations of Paxos and sort of all of the stuff <laughs> yeah. that you run into when you do that. Can you recommend anything similar for chain replication? Um, I think Scott tried to, so, so he wrote a paper uh, called Chain Replication in Practice or something. Uh, that has some stuff, but it doesn't really have reconfiguration as well. Um, yeah, so why don't we make it? <laughs> Do you want to write it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, um, uh, to I be a, having worked with Scott on the Machu work a little bit, um, that was a goal of, of the Machu work, and Denise knows that too. That was, but we, they never finished the paper, and there was a lot of other components to failure recognition with uh, with uh, chain replication. But you know, I think the work of the chart beat the work that Denise is doing now. I think that's closer to where we're going with it. Yeah. Yeah. So like the open source that I'm trying to create right now is like a way of being able to write that paper at some point. It doesn't really have to be a paper either, but like just having an open source implementation that also deals with you know, reconfiguration and changing things on the fly and things like the load balancing and having maybe just one uh, command line argument to change the consistency and things like that, that would be really cool. So uh, I generally work all, on all of my projects uh, alone, so uh, sadly, so things take a lot of time. Uh, so if you wanna help, <laughs> Please do. Yes. Yeah. That's the thing of papers we love. We're just trying to get uh, academics some help. Uh, <laughs> but no, but I, I think it means something. I mean, having known a lot of this work, uh, multi-tiered replication models for, for, for distributed systems is actually a really important thing. Companies use it all the time. I mean, Tripeat's a good example is one, but, uh, but others as well. So I think it's, it's really great. Yeah.